Hello, welcome to Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Rochelle Harrison Pless. Thanks for joining us. Coming up. Slaughtered during morning prayers, a man stabs to death two worshippers at a mosque near Cape Town in a brutal attack disturbingly similar to last month's fatal stabbing at a mosque near Durban. I'll have more details with our correspondent. An emotional final farewell. Congolese pro-democracy activist Luke Nkulalula is laid to rest. The 33-year-old was a prominent member of the opposition movement against President Kabila. Plus, blending poetry, traditional rhythms and languages from across the continent. The musical stylings of Lorinda Hofmeyer and the Afrique Mon Désir Ensemble reflect a longing for Africa. They're here to talk about the project as they gear up for a series of concerts here in France. Good to have you with us. First up, a mosque on the outskirts of Cape Town has been rocked by a brutal rampage. On Thursday, a Somali man attacked worshippers with a knife, fatally stabbing two people and wounding at least two others. According to South African authorities, the assailant was shot dead by police after refusing to surrender. Now, the bloodshed comes just one month after a similar deadly stabbing at another South African mosque. Well, for more on this story, let's now cross to our Cape Town correspondent, Aisha Ismail. Aisha, uh, what more do we know about how the attack unfolded and also the, uh, the attacker's motive? Well, let me just start off by saying that the um, Muslims in Cape Town are still in shock following this daily attack in the wee hours of this morning. What we do know is that the, the Hawks, the elite investigative unit of the South African Police Service, have taken over this investigation and they're treating it as a priority case. Now, we do know that two people were killed and two others um, were injured. Two of the, those two people are still in hospital. We've also heard from the Muslim Judicial Council that they have condemned the attack and that they are not prepared to give any more information as to what the possible motive could have been for this attack to have taken place in the mosque. Now, what we do know is that the Somali national, Somali national came into the mosque early in the morning and asked for a place to stay. He came into the mosque and people who were in the mosque at the time to mark the last 10 days of the holy month of Ramadan welcomed him to the mosque. He then took out a knife and started stabbing at them and fatally wounding two people. And he was then shot dead by police when he tried to flee the premises of the mosque. Well, as you said, Aisha, this comes uh, as the holy month of Ramadan uh, draws to a close, but also a month after a similar attack, uh, which police said had, quote, elements of extremism. Are there any links uh, to that deadly stabbing near Durban? It's very difficult to say because, it, it, as you say, it's been a month since that attack in Durban. We've had no further information from the South African police on what their investigations have, have, have proved or whether they have made any further progress. However, some security experts have said that they do not believe that that attack in the Durban mosque had anything to do with terrorism or religious intolerance or sectarianism. In fact, one security expert said that she believed that it was somebody who had a personal vendetta against the imam of that particular mosque. So it is very difficult to say whether there is a link between these two incidents. But what we do know is that the man who was the, the attacker of the um, mosque in Cape Town, in fact, Somalians have said that he does have a history of mental illness. OK, Aisha Ismail, thank you very much uh, for updating us on that story. Aisha Ismail in Cape Town there for us. To other news now, mourners in Goma bade a final farewell to Luke Nkulula, the Congolese pro-democracy activist who died last weekend. The 33-year-old was a founding member of the country's Struggle for Change movement, which opposes President Joseph Kabila's grip on power. Nicolas Germain reports. Luke Kalula was one of the pro-democracy Lucha movement's most appreciated activists. 
A large crowd gathered for his funeral in Goma on Thursday. He died last week in a fire in his house, a suspicious fire according to his friends. An investigation has been opened. His allies say they will continue his struggle against President Joseph Kabila. Lucha says he must step down as his official mandate ended in December 2016. The spirit of Luke will accompany us in our actions. It will give us more strength to fight against the evil in this country. I say to the youth of this republic and to its activists, do not succumb to fear. Luke Kalula's friends are inconsolable. His sister paid tribute to him. She was close by when the fire broke out. I saw my brother in the flames. The curtain fell on him. He was struggling. He said, my love, run away. If something happens to you, I will not forgive myself. My brother really loved me. Luke Kulula was 33 years old. Above all, he liked to take part in debates and train young activists. They said they would never forget him. Next, the sacred Islamic month of Ramadan is coming to a close, with daily fasting soon giving way to the feasting and celebration of Eid. In Morocco, many Muslims saw the holy month as a good time to kick-start a healthier lifestyle, with an increasing focus on nutrition, exercise and well-being. This report from our team on the ground, as told by Josh Fardy. The end of the daily Ramadan fast is approaching in Casablanca, but plenty of joggers still have the energy to go out and pound the pavement. Physical exercise over Ramadan has become increasingly widespread among Moroccans. It's like a detox you do every year. It purifies the body and the mind, and it's an opportunity to do some sport and lose some weight. <laughs> Losing weight is a common resolution for many Moroccans during Ramadan. Each week, this nutritionist provides information and advice to listeners during the holy month. After fasting all day, it can be hard to avoid fatty or sugary foods at the evening meal. You have to start with water at room temperature, eat three dates and rest a little to give your stomach time to adapt and understand that it will be receiving food. And you need to avoid snacking because from the time you end fasting until sunrise, you could eat a lot and that could be bad. For some wealthy urbanites, the yearly Ramadan fast sits comfortably with recent wellness trends. This yoga class by the sea has been specially organized for the month of fasting. Ramadan is a time when people of all ages get together for relaxing activities. It's not about watching the time pass before we break the fast at sundown. It's a moment that can participate in the balance that we seek during the month, the balance of a good diet and a healthy lifestyle. At sundown, it's time for everyone to break their fast. This restaurant, with its menu focused on healthy eating, has become a hit. People have been trying to be more healthy for about three years now. There's a lot of talk of detox, everything organic, anything healthy. Wellness has been doing a roaring trade during this year's Ramadan, but it's still a trend mostly out of the reach of ordinary working Moroccans. And finally, French, Afrikaans, Lingala, they're all languages spoken on the African continent. And they've come together through music now, thanks to South African musician Lorinda Hoffmeyer and the Afrique Mon Désir Ensemble. Well, she and her bassist from the group uh, Skulk Joubert join me on set. Welcome to you both. Uh, now, your collective is based in Cape Town, South Africa, and you've set French language poems uh, from Francophone Africa to music. Uh, they evoke longing for the continent and the connection uh, between its people. What more can you tell us about the project? Well, uh, it's a project that has a literary side and also the music side. And the literary side is the, the, all the poems from Francophone uh, po 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 poets from Africa. And then the musical side is also quite diverse. We, have, we work with musicians from uh, Congo and from Cameroon and also on the recording. There was the famous Regis Kizavo from um, uh, Madagascar. He also contributed. So, um, yeah, it's, it's this multicultural project. So, Skulk, how important is it to have this, uh, this diverse mix? I think it's important. Where we live in Cape Town, it's a very cosmopolitan city where it's a meeting point of 
people from all over Africa and Europe. And I think it's a very natural progression for Lorinda, who's been working with poetry and music her whole life, um, to diversify in other African uh, styles and, and the French language, which is something that she's also been... Um, yes, long ago I had French at school, yeah. at university. And now we're very aware of all the people from other African countries that's, that are French-speaking. Mm. And uh, South Africa is more or less more mm. to uh, English uh, orientated. And so this is a project to open our eyes to another side of the continent. Oh. Well, you know? let's take a quick look uh, at a clip of you performing Sous la Terre. So what drove you to, to form this group and embark on this uh, musical adventure together? Well, it was actually a project that was initiated by the Cape Town Music Academy. And it's this, uh, an academy that wants to create platforms for uh, uh, opportunities for mu South African musicians to perform. And uh, also for all the musicians living in Cape Town. So I was actually... Um, the, the 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 head of the academy, Nico McLachlan, actually asked me if I want if I would be interested in doing this project, and I said yes. And for, and a bit later, after I um, did the compositions, they said, why don't we also uh, uh, let other musicians from all other countries take part, you know, and make it a true. Multicultural, multicultural mix, mm. melting yes. pot. Yes. Now, Lorinda, you were uh, already used to setting Afrikaans poetry yes. to music. Uh, that's something you're well known for. What are the challenges when it comes to working in French and, and a language that isn't your own? Yeah, there's a big challenge. <laughs> uh, like I say, I've had French a long time ago at university. But I had a very good uh, a friend and a person who's very knowledgeable, Kat Catherine de Tuy, and she... Uh, the process was uh, she introduced me to some poetry and I sort of worked through them, looked up all the words in the dictionary and then we had a discussion and then after that I chose poetry. That was a very enriching process. Uh, yeah. And so. what are you most looking forward to uh, about the French crowds, about playing to French, uh, French crowds? Well, it's the first time that I would actually test it and, you know, how is it perceived? Um, my accent, how bad is it? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and uh, your French is the, better than your English. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, if the subtleties, is it there? I, 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 I tried my best to get into into the poetry, you know. So um, because the music always follows for me, the music follows the words. Actually, it has to fit. To fit properly and enlighten, enlighten the poet. Yes. You know. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for being here, Lorinda Hoffmeyer, and the Afrique Mon Désir Ensemble are kicking off their French tour tomorrow night here in Paris at The New Morning. The new album, Afrique Mon Désir, is out now. Well, stay with us here on France 24. Lots more news coming up after this. Revisited. Presented by Stuart Norville. In April 1992, Yugoslavia split apart. When Bosnia, Herzegovina and Croatia declared independence, the predominantly Serb Federal Army attacked. Evidence of the war is still visible today in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Unemployment, poverty and destruction. Bosnians view the pre-war times with nostalgia. In Croatia, now part of the European Union, the economy is thriving thanks to tourism and memories of the former Yugoslavia are less positive. What does the future hold for their young generations? Two countries, two visions for stability. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.